Good morning, everyone. Today's scripture reading is from Colossians 4, verses 2 through 6. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. All right, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for giving us your word to guide us and to teach us. God, you are so good, so patient with us, so gracious. And God, I just pray that your word will go, will go forth in these next few minutes, God, um, that you are guiding my speech, that you are softening hearts to hear your word. God, that is, it is all seasoned with you. Uh, we just thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your love for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. My name is Evan Brem. Uh, if I haven't met you yet, I've been with the church since July as the pastor in residence. It really is a, a privilege to get to be here, to get to serve with you all, to get to know you all. Um, if, I, if I haven't gotten to know you yet, I am looking forward to doing that. That's just one of the privileges we have of being involved in a community of this size. Uh, I really do value that. And I'm just thankful to get to be here and get to serve in this capacity, learn from the pastors here, learn from, from you all. Um, so this morning, where we're going to be is moving through our series in Colossians. We're going to continue through. We're going to be in chapter 4, verses 2 to 6. So if, if you haven't been here recently or missed a few weeks, we've been moving verse by verse through the book of Colossians, and we're just looking at the verses. What does God have to say here in the context of the book? This is a letter that Paul, the apostle, wrote to a church, and so it's all read together. It's all tied together, and so how do we interpret what he's saying based on the rest of the letter? So we're going to be, again, chapter 4, verses 2 to 6 today. But before we get there, we're going to rewind back to 1964 um, in New York City. There's a woman named Kitty Genovese. And if you have had an intro to psych class, maybe, or you were alive in 1964 and watched the news, then you might recognize her name. So what happened with Kitty Genovese is that she was a bartender. Late one night, she was coming home from work um, to her apartment in Queens, and so New York City, right, very densely populated. She was going through an alleyway to get to her apartment late at night, and she was attacked. She was attacked by one, uh, one offender, and he assaulted her. And what happened was when that was going on, when she cried out for help, 37 of her neighbors heard it. 37 of her neighbors heard it, and many of them saw it as well. And so because this was happening, they, many turned on their lights, maybe came on, out on their balconies to see what was happening. And so that initially scared the attacker away. Right? Because that makes sense. You know, you're attacking someone in the dark of night in an alley and lights start coming on. People start poking their heads out. And so he leaves. But what's crazy is that none of those 37 people called 911. So for an extended period of time, when the police didn't come, the attacker then returned and killed her. Because no one called 911. No one came down to help. Even though 37 of her neighbors saw what was happening or heard what was happening, people who probably lived by her, maybe had seen her or recognized her and knew her, and no one did anything. And so after the fact, the reason I said it maybe if you've had an intro to psych class, you've heard this, because people were baffled. What would lead people to do nothing in this kind of situation? And what, that, what came out of that instance was a concept known as the bystander effect. And so what the, the bystander effect is, when they, when they looked at why didn't people help, said maybe, maybe people didn't know what to do. They figured someone else would. Maybe people didn't care enough to help. Or someone else will care enough. Maybe people thought, that's not my job. That's someone else's job. And that, in essence, is the bystander effect because all of these reasons take the responsibility for helping off of ourselves and place it on an imaginary person. So the bystander effect is seeing a problem but choosing to do nothing about it in hopes that someone else will. And the bystander effect influences the lack of sharing the gospel for Christians. 
That's how this ties to us. And in the scripture for today, in Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 6, Paul takes this responsibility for sharing the gospel and places it squarely on our shoulders. So that's where we're at today. Where do we start with sharing the gospel? And the main idea that we're going to work through is motivated by the foundation of Jesus Christ. Sharing the gospel begins with prayer and leads to our personal witness. And so the way that we're going to move through this main idea is that we're going to break it up into three chunks. We're going to start with the first chunk and then talk about how do we have our foundation in Christ and then move on to the next two. So we'll just work through this main idea. Okay, so first we're going to start with being motivated by the foundation of Jesus Christ. How How is that involved in us sharing the gospel? And so to do this, we're going to have to move backwards in Colossians and see the foundation that Paul is building this section in chapter 4 on. Because remember, this is a letter that Paul is, all of this is context, all Colossians 1, 2, and 3 leading up to this is context for what Paul says now. All right, and so in verse 3, I think helps us point backwards, because what verse 3 says is, at the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ. So declaring the mystery of Christ, that's the goal. And so what is the mystery of Christ? And this is something that Paul has defined earlier in Colossians. So if if we look back, if you look back in your Bibles to chapter 1, verses 26 to 27, just flip one page back maybe, Paul says, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. So this mystery that Paul's praying that a door would be open to declare is now revealed. It's no longer a mystery. It says, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of his glory, riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So what is the mystery that Paul is praying to have a door open to reveal? It's it's Christ, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Chapter 2 expands on it as well, verses 2 and 3 It says that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. So just verse 2 there, which is Christ. So what is this mystery that Paul's praying that can have an open door to share? It's the mystery of Christ, God's salvation through Jesus Christ. And I think that hangs on two things. Hangs on who is Christ and what has he done? For, for, for who is Christ, we look to, to Pastor Scott preached on this a few weeks ago, verses 15 to 20 there, they call it one of the greatest hymns of the Bible, one of the greatest exaltations of the lordship of Jesus Christ. And what we see here is that Jesus is the one whom all things were created through and for. All things created through and for him. He's before all things. He's holding all things together. He's all-powerful, completely God, worthy of all worship and glory, and nothing is out of his grasp. He is God. So there's this mystery of God revealed in Jesus Christ because then he goes and does what? Who is Christ and what has he done? We just look down a few more verses in chapter 1, verses 20 to, to 22, and we really see this main truth. You were alienated from God but Jesus Christ reconciled you. You were alienated, hostile, evil. These are not my words. These are God's words in scripture. These are the descriptors used for us outside of Christ. Alienated, hostile, and evil, but he, God, humbled himself to death in order to reconcile you to himself, to present you holy and blameless before himself. So this mystery of Christ that Paul is praying to open a door to, to, to preach is the gospel. And I love this quote from Andy Johnson. He wrote a book on missions. And so we can, when we're talking about where do we start in sharing the gospel, sharing the gospel is, you know, integral to missions. So when Andy Johnson says the heart for God glorifying missions, we can hear that as the heart for God glorifying sharing the gospel starts with joy in the gospel. Our churches must cherish the God who sent his own son to save sinners like us. The right fuel matters. The right foundation matters. To share the gospel, we must first cherish the gospel. 
So as we move into Colossians 4 here, I mean, you remember everything we've been in earlier in Colossians. This is what Paul builds everything off of. He doesn't just command us to pray and share the gospel. He says, look, look at who Christ is. Look at what we have. Look at what he's done. He shows us that we were broken, lost, dead, destined for hell, but Jesus Christ stepped in. And and here's just the beautiful way he describes it in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. He canceled the debt. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. This is the logic that sets up Colossians 4. Of course, we would want that for other people, right? And this is where the bystander effect comes in. And choose to ignore the fact that anyone and everyone who does not trust in Jesus Christ as Lord will, without fail, suffer, suffer eternally under God's wrath in hell, while we bask eternally in the riches of Christ in heaven. So the bystander effect is for Christians is ignoring the eternal state of those who do not trust Christ. That's not my job. That's someone else's. John Piper says this, Christians care about all suffering, especially eternal suffering, else they have a defective heart or a flameless hell. It's a good, real, challenging quote there. So if it's that big of an issue, where do we start? Where do we start with sharing the gospel? So we'll we'll now move into our sections of Colossians for today, chapter 4, verses 2 to 6 which is the section of the letter that takes an outward turn. So last week, Pastor Scott preached on what does Christ's lordship mean for my marriage and for my interaction in the workplace? What does it mean for my interaction there? And now this week, we'll move into what does Christ's lordship mean for them? What does Christ's lordship mean for those who do not know him, for those who do not trust Christ? Where do we start with sharing the gospel? Remember, our main idea is motivated by the foundation of Jesus Christ. So that's what we already touched on. Sharing the gospel begins with prayer and leads to our personal witness. So Colossians 4, starting in verse 2, Paul says, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. So right at the beginning here, Paul establishes the priority of prayer. In sharing the gospel. Steadfastness communicates a habitual devotion to prayer. And and this verse may just sound like a basic encouragement to pray, but remember, we're looking at things in context and seeing the group of verses that he puts this with. And so the group of verses shows us that Paul groups this command with an evangelistic focus. So that's the kind of prayer that Paul is mainly talking about here, is mainly evangelical. Because Paul says, look, right in this same verse, he says we must be both watchful and thankful in our steadfast prayer. And both of these are grounded in the work of Christ. Because watchfulness in prayer is being aware of the reality of the time that we live in. Keeping our spiritual eyes open, not asleep, but awake to the reality of the time. I think there's two verses in the New Testament that sum this up really well. We have Romans 13, verse 11 says this. Besides this, you know the time. The hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. He says, he's writing to the church in Rome. He's saying, many of you probably didn't start believing in Christ that long ago. But even from yesterday to today, Christ's return, the complete inauguration of our salvation, the complete fulfillment of it is closer now than it was yesterday. So the main idea there is that Christ's return is imminent. It is close. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 then says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. 
realms. So we live in this in-between when Christ has lived as a man on earth, died on the cross, resurrected from the dead, and then promises to return and inaugurate all things that he has promised, the fullness of his presence with his people, the new heavens and the new earth. But we live in the in-between. Christ has come, but he has not yet returned. And so in this in-between, it says our, flesh is, our, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but there is a spiritual battle, battle waging for our souls and for the souls of those who do not know Christ. That's the reality of the time that we live in, and that's why we are encouraged to be watchful and alert in our prayer. We're also encouraged to be thankful in our prayer. And thankfulness is the defining feature of prayer that has understood everything that we just talked about, has understood the gospel, that because I understand the gospel, I understand that I don't deserve an ounce of the grace that God has poured out on me. I was dead, and now I am alive because of him. There's no other piece of that story but that I am thankful for, to God for that. So Paul says, are you awake? Do you understand that there's a spiritual battle going on for the eternal state of people's souls? And are you thankful? Do you understand that it is only because of Christ that you have hope for eternity? So where does this watchfulness and thankfulness in prayer lead? Look at verse 3. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. So Paul asks for partnership of the Colossian church in praying that God would open doors for him to share the gospel. And remember, Paul is in prison. Verse three is the first time he mentions this in the whole letter. And I can imagine the Colossian church, you know, reading this letter from Paul, they, they would probably read it at an assembly of the church. And, and they, you know, they're reading, they're like, man, I really like this Paul guy. You know, he's, he's tough, he's challenging, but I like what he has to say. And then they're like, wait, he's in prison? Again? Like, yeah, I think he's there a lot. <laughs> and Paul is in prison because of his work for Christ, so unjustly. And so what do you think you would pray for if you were in prison unjustly because of your faith? Probably a way out. Because it's happened before, too. Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 12, Acts chapter 16. God miraculously intervenes to, to rescue some of his apostles out of prison. And here, the cool thing, too, is that we know if, if Acts is written as a historical book, and so we can see chronologically kind of moving through the early church here, Acts chapter 5, 12, and 16 is, is when we see God free some of his apostles from prison. It's not until Acts 13 that Paul is even sent out to do his ministry from the church in Antioch. So we know that when Paul was sent out, when, when he was penning this letter to the Colossians, it's, it's extremely safe to assume that he would have known of these occurrences where God had freed his people from jail. So Paul's sitting in jail, but he's not asking for that. And I don't, even, I don't think it would have been wrong for Paul to ask for them to pray for his freedom. But the fact that he doesn't emphasizes what he is saying in verse Three, because not only does Paul ask for prayer for God to open a door for the gospel, he also asks that when God does open a door, verse four, that he may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. So he prays that God would open a door for the gospel, but also that God would make his speech clear when he steps through that door that God opens for the gospel. So here's two really important things that we understand from Paul's requests in these prayer. One, God is the one who opens, doors, who opens doors for the gospel. God is the one who opens doors. This is the Apostle Paul who wrote most of the New Testament. You think if, if he could open a door by himself, he probably would have done it. But what he understands is that without the supernatural intervening of God, a presentation of the gospel will fall on deaf ears. He prays that God would open doors because God is the one who opens doors. Second, God is the one who makes our communication of the gospel useful. Again, Paul, he, God used Paul to write most of the New Testament. It's from him that we get a bunch of our understanding of the gospel. But Paul is now writing that God would help him make his presentation of the gospel clear. If you ask me, hey, we need someone to present the gospel, you want it to be you or the Apostle Paul? The Apostle Paul. 
but he is asking that God would make his presentation of it clear. So the reality is God is the one who makes our communication of the gospel useful. Paul understands that he cannot share the gospel in a place that God has not prepared, and Paul understands that he cannot usefully articulate the gospel without God's help. Prayer as the first step in sharing the gospel is crucial because we are useless without the power of God. Imagine that. (laughs) Here's the challenge. If our easily distracted hearts can get to a place where we really begin to consider the goodness of the gospel in light of the reality of the terror of hell, we can be tempted to skip this step of prayer. Maybe you feel you don't have time for prayer. You don't trust that prayer is actually working or worthwhile. And you don't think you can pray well enough. But what we see from Paul here, what is prayer but coming before God with weak, empty hands saying, God, I can't do this on my own. Paul's requests for prayer are grounded in the understanding that his presentation of the gospel, his desire to share the gospel, is useless without the power of God. That is is where we need to start in sharing the gospel. So then what? Remember our main idea, motivated by the foundation of Jesus Christ, sharing the gospel begins with prayer and leads to our personal witness. So verses five and six. Verse five, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of time. Let your speech always be gracious seasoned with salt so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So here, Paul begins to talk about our personal witness. Built on our cherishing of the gospel, catalyzed by our prayers, how then should we think about our interactions with non-Christians? He says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders in verse 5. Paul asks for prayer in regards to his sharing the gospel with non-Christians, and then immediately goes into the Colossian church church's interactions with non-Christians. So the focus in this section clearly is still in regards to sharing the gospel. So Paul is saying, would you pray for me to share the gospel? Now let me talk about your interaction with non-Christians. It's clearly still in regards to the, the witnessing opportunities for the gospel of the Colossian church. And that's how we should think about it for us. So wisdom should characterize our interactions. What does wisdom look like? I think first is the mindset, verse five, making the best use of time. So remember back in verse two, Paul encourages the church to pray watchfully. That's alert to the time that we are in. And he says, okay, we're watchful and let's also make the best use of time. This bolsters the conclusion that Paul has an eternal perspective in mind when he commands the Colossians to be watchful. So making the best use of time, time is short and Christ's return is imminent. It is near. There will be a day when Christ returns and everyone who has ever lived will stand before him to be judged. That is a reality. On that day, there will be one defining factor if you're judged into eternal life or eternal punishment. Who is Jesus Christ? And Paul has lined this up throughout Colossians. Colossians 1, Jesus is Lord of all. Colossians 2, in his death, he nailed my sin to the cross. In Colossians 3, in his resurrection, he has given me new life that I may follow him as Lord. So walking in wisdom, be alert to the time that we are in and make the best use of it. Finally, in verse 6, in this section about how we should think about sharing the gospel, Paul addresses the words that are actually coming out of our mouths. (laughs) So we see the foundation that is laid that leads up to it. It's the last step. There's so much that goes before it. But what does he say about it? First, he says, let your speech always be gracious. This is unsurprising because we carry a message of grace. (laughs) I think it'd be tempting to think, well, I carry a message of truth, which is also true, so I can be truthful without being gracious because the truth hurts. Well, the truth does hurt, but we are biblically called, the biblical witness on this is to portray the truth graciously and in love. And to be seasoned with salt. That's the next meaning for how we should approach our interactions with people. In the the context of the time and other literature in this era that that this metaphor of being seasoned with salt is used in, what it really boils down to is it just just means winsome. Are you winsome in your communication? And then finally we have that you would know how you ought to answer each person. 
I think what's really interesting is seeing the parallels that we have between this verse 6 of Colossians and then 1 Peter chapter 3. So just look at verse 6. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Then Peter says in 1 Peter 3.15, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. So Peter says do it with gentleness and respect. Paul says let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt. Peter says, be prepared to make a defense to anyone asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. And Paul says that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So, so, so this is the, the burden on us that from those two verses, it says to share our faith, we must consider the burden of being able to articulate why it is that we believe what we believe. We must be able to articulate why it is that we believe what we believe. And not just what makes sense to us, but in a way that the Bible would affirm. James D.G. Dunn communicates the thrust of these verses well. He says this, Paul pictures a church expected to hold its own in the social setting of marketplaces, baths, and meal tables, and to win attention by the attractiveness of its life and speech. And so we can contextualize that for us. And, you know, a church expected to hold its own in the social setting of grocery stores and gym locker rooms and meal tables with our neighbors to win attention by the attractiveness of its life and speech. So what this does, th- these two verses here, it teaches us that sharing the gospel, even in our interactions, starts long before actually saying the words. At some point, we will present the gospel to someone in order to share it. That's necessary. There is a saying that says, preach the gospel at all times, use words when necessary. Words will be necessary to share the gospel. (laughs) There is a gospel message. But that will come in most cases in a way that have been prepared through prayer and then through a relationship built on your grace-filled, salt-seasoned interactions. Your whole life is a witness to Christ. That's That's what these verses are getting at here. God may be opening a door to, to the gas station clerk that you see on a weekly basis or, the, or the, the grocery cashier that you always check out with. Your interactions matter. The way you carry yourself matters. Your whole life is a witness. He may be opening a door to your neighbor whose grass is always too long and always stays out making noise on their back patio too late. But this scripture teaches us that the way you handle those interactions could be the first fruits of an eternally significant gospel presentation. Our whole life is a witness to Christ. And this brings us back to the bystander effect. Have you seen from this text, Paul does not imagine a church that stands back and watches a dying world fall into hell. It's not biblical. It's not in there. What is in the Bible is this, that motivated by the foundation of Jesus Christ, sharing the gospel begins with prayer and leads to our personal witness. So where do we start? We must understand that we carry a message worth sharing. We carry a message of hope. That whatever someone that you interact with is going through, what I, I'm, I'm certain I've talked to some of you and I know what some people in your lives are walking through right now who don't know the Lord. But whatever it is that they are walking through, this is a message of hope, eternal hope that you were dead and now you are alive. We have to understand that our message is worth sharing. And next we have to understand we are useless to share it without God's help. Paul asks for an open door to the word. He's in prison. He is a captive audience. There it is. He's a captive audience. Why not just share the gospel? Because Paul knows that unless God has prepared someone to hear, the message of Jesus Christ will fall on deaf ears. We are useless to share it without his help. Third thing then is pray with open hands for open doors. Pray for open doors for the courage to listen when God answers the prayers for open doors and for wisdom and grace in those interactions. In all of this, we need to remember that we are not the ones who save souls. God is. He's given us the joyful opportunity to step into the work he is doing here. 
I often feel guilty for not sharing the gospel enough. But I think that's a wrong application of this scripture to feel obligated to go and share the gospel more. I think that if that's what we get out of this, if that's what we leave with, we miss what God is welcoming us into here. We're not called to share the gospel out of a guilt-ridden, mindless obedience. We are instead called to share the gospel out of an overflow of what we have come to treasure in our lives, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So remember, all of these statements have their foundation in Colossians 1, that we stand before the Lord whom Paul has described, the one who created everything for himself, the one who is before all things, holding all things together, all-powerful, completely God, nothing out of his grasp. So it's, it, it, it is him that we are charged to stand before and pray. And what a great encouragement that is to pray, to pray for these open doors, to pray for the courage to step into these interactions, that it's the God who created everything, that nothing is out of his grasp that we pray to. So we're actually going to wrap this time up together uh, with some prayer together. That seems fitting with today's scripture. And so I just have a few p- prayer points here that we'll put on the screen that uh, I-, I want you to walk through. But actually, what I would ask you to do, we're just going to take about five minutes here. But you would just turn to a person next to you or, or two or three people, small groups, and just work through these things. First, that God would lead this church to cherish Jesus Christ and his gospel above all else. That's the fuel. That's the foundation. That God then would place a heavy burden on this church for those in our community who do not know him. That God would lead this church to grasp the necessity and power of prayer in sharing the gospel. That God would open doors for the gospel in our community and in our personal relationships. And that God would grant us the alertness, the wisdom, and the courage to step into the opportunities he graciously provides. So take five minutes here and pray with the people around you, and then I'll close us. Thank you for what you've done for us, God, something that we could never have done for ourselves. I pray, God, that in this church that you are just teaching us to cherish your gospel, to feel a weight of the reality of people who do not know you and your goodness. I pray that you are opening doors for this church in this community. They are filling us with alertness, watchfulness, and wisdom and grace to step into opportunities that you provide, Lord. I pray for the relationships of people with this church, with people who do not know you. Lord, you are so good to us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.